uh, quickly, I just want to remind you that the reason, or a reason, if not the reason, that we're really studying the gospel according to Luke is so that we can, we can have a certainty of the things that we've been taught. Remember, that's what we looked at the first lesson in chapter 1 and verse 4. It said that, that you can know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. Now, how many of us have been taught about Christmas? <laughs> okay, good. Are you certain? about that stuff. You see, because what we've done is we all have our own Christmas stories. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> you know, we take what the preacher says, and we take what mom and dad said, and we take what the Sunday school teacher said, and we throw in a little Santa Claus, we throw in a few elves and some reindeer, and uh, some mistletoe, and we come up with our own little Christmas story. And, uh, and you know, I have problems with that, and many of you know I do. And over the years, you see, it's, it defiles it to me. That's just how, you know. So today I want to talk to you about the Christmas story. Now, I know it's 13 days before Christmas. I counted them. I know how far it is. And, but I want you to think about this and, and enjoy this time. Hopefully that what we'll discuss today will be more in your thinking. So I'm not going to attempt to mess around with your nativity scenes. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to mess with your Santa Claus and your elves and your stuff like that. I'm not going to do any of that. If you, if, it, it, it's, it, this, it's an if there. If you will agree with me that for the most part, society has basically lost the real reason for Christmas. Okay, so I can go on now. I won't have to mess with your stuff. So uh, that's what I want to talk about a little bit. I'm not going to get into all of that stuff. But you see, we think so little about the real reason for, for, for this time of the year. Well, for example, how much will you actually, literally think about Jesus over the next couple of weeks? Let me, let me guess. About an hour while you're here, Right? Something like that. Because, but I'm doing it a week earlier this week, so you, you'll get two, two hours this year. Uh, we just don't think about it. And, and you know, I'm, I'm that way too. We'll have our family get together, and I'll be with the grandkids and children and wife and friends and all that. And so I'm not, I'm not thinking about it either. So I'm not saying that you're bad because, you know, we don't. But, but I'm saying that I think God would have us, though, at least to know for certainty the truths of the Christmas story so that we can forward the truth on to our children and on to our grandchildren. Do you agree with that? So I want to talk about some things that I think we'll find in the Christmas story that will really add some understanding to it for us. And I'm really believing that we're going to all go out of here uh, knowing something about this time of the year and what happened uh, all those years ago when Jesus was born that we didn't come in with. So what do we need to know? What do we need to pass on to our kids? Let's start back in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, you remember what's happening here is Adam and Eve have fallen. Uh, now God is there and he's speaking to each one of them and now he's speaking to the serpent. So in Genesis 3, 15 it says, And I, God, will put enmity between you and the what? And the woman. Not the man, but the woman. And between your offspring and hers, not his, hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, this was four millennia ago, maybe five. It's difficult to count. <laughs> but, but it's a long time. It was a millennia and millennia and millennia ago. It was two millennia at least before it ever happened, before, before that offspring of the woman really came forth. So this is something that God has talked about for millennia. Then, 700 years before the story actually happened, Isaiah wrote, this is 2,700 years ago, millennia. Isaiah wrote this in Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. God's going to give this sign. It's not something anybody else can do. This is a sign straight from God. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. We've got to have a virgin pregnant and we've got to have a son. And we'll call him what? Emmanuel. Now, let me tell you what Christmas is about. It's not about the baby. It's about Emmanuel. It, 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 it's not about the drummer boy, you know. You... <laughs> there wasn't any drummer boy there. 
But it's not about any of that. What it's about is Emmanuel. That's what Christmas is about. Let me show you the literal meaning of Emmanuel. Here it is. It, it, it means literally with us is God. We say God with us, but the literal meaning is with us is God. Now, we need to understand the importance of Emmanuel. Had it not been for Emmanuel, you and I would be destined for hell. Our children would be destined for hell. Our parents would be destined for hell. Our grandchildren would be destined for hell. Without Emmanuel, there is no Savior. you got to have a Savior. So Emmanuel came, and that's the importance of it to you and to me, is Emmanuel. So around 400 years now, before the actual Christmas story happened, 2,400 years ago, we're still talking millennia, in Micah 5.2, it says this, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephraim, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from the old, from everlasting, who, who, who he's, he's saying here, who I've talked about forever. <laughs> he's coming, and he's going to come out of Bethlehem. That's where he's coming from. So, if Mary is the virgin carrying Emmanuel, she's living in Nazareth, and she's nine months pregnant. And what God has got to do is get her to Bethlehem, 80 miles away, on foot. And she's about to pop. She's ready. And so how is he going to do this? So one thing that we need to see and relate to our children and understand is that God is the God of providence. God is the God of time. And he is controlling time all around you. He's controlling time he was controlling time then. He's controlling time right now. We've talked about it some. So let's read here. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days. <laughs> yes, there it is. It's time. In, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree. The Greek word is dogma. And what it means is a mandate. Mandate. Man has a date. You've got to be here on this particular date. Mandate. Decree. That a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And how many went? Do you think they wanted to go? Do you think Mary and Joseph really wanted to go? Nine months pregnant, 80 miles. But everyone went to his own town to register. Caesar Augustus was the greatest Caesar of them all. That's what history says. He ruled the Roman Empire, the then known world, for over 50 years. He was the most powerful person in all of the world. Now, Quirinius, he was the governor of the Syria area, which is the area in which Joseph and Mary lived around Nazareth there. And so what the, the decree said is, I want a census taken. It's amazing how just at this particular moment, he decides he wants to have a census. And so Quirinius jumps on it. See, Quirinius has to prove how important he is and how necessary he is. He has to report to Augustus and he has to report to Rome. And so he wants to look important. So he's going to make everybody go so that they can have a good census. Because taxes depend on that. His income depends on that. Rome's help. Just like now, the census determines how much financial help we get from the government right here. So it was important that they go. So he mandated it. He decreed it. And what has to happen now is if you don't come, there's severe punishment. And so everyone went to their hometown. Just amazing how God worked all this out. See, what God did is God used the most powerful person in the world, most powerful man in the world, to get <laughs> that baby, that Baby born to Bethlehem, that, that, that woman who's carrying that baby to Bethlehem. I want us to make sure that we put this together. See, God is working all around you all the time. Let, let, let's run through our little thing here. God is good all the, all the what? What are we saying? We're saying God is around us working all the time because he's good to me all the time. All the time he's working around me. But we don't realize that's really what we're saying and we really don't believe it. <laughs> Until we look at life. I want to use this example. I asked if I could. A man in our, in our church had a, 
had a had a surgery. He uh, he it was a pretty serious surgery, and and we prayed for him. I prayed for him. I laid hands on him, prayed, and, and uh, the elders prayed for him, and and God just didn't heal. We didn't, you know. I cursed it. I spoke to it. I did everything I know to do, and God didn't move that way. And he had the surgery. So he's home now recovering from, from the surgery. And while he's home recovering from the surgery, his wife becomes despondent. Her liver shuts down, her kidneys shut down. He has to rush her, call the MTs, rush her to the hospital. She was dying. Now, here's the thing. Had he not been home recovering from the surgery that we all prayed that he wouldn't have to have, his wife would be dead, and instead of celebrating Christmas, they'd be mourning the loss of a wife and a mother. God is working all the time around you, around me, around all of us. <laughs> but we just don't see it that way. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Ecclesiastes 3 talks about there's a time for everything under the sun and a time for every purpose on, on, in heaven. So, so but he, he summarizes that up in Ecclesiastes 3.11. Let me read it to you. Everything is appropriate in its own time. Everything. But though God has planted eternity in the hearts of people, in the hearts of men, even so, watch now, many cannot see the whole scope of God's work. Isn't that so true? From beginning to end. We, we say God's good all the time, but, but do we see God good all the time? Is he, do we really figure this thing out? God is good all the time. And Mary and Joseph, I'm sure, were fussing. I don't want to go to Bethlehem. I'm nine months pregnant. I don't want to go. And Joseph surely didn't want to go with a nine-month pregnant woman. They were fussing. This is stupid. We've got to go to some goofy senses. But all the time, God's working. What are you fussing about? What is it that you're praying won't happen? See, God is good, help me, all the time. In your good times, in your bad times, in the times of census, <laughs> in the times of taxes, in the times of Obama, God is still good. <laughs> well, Augustus, I mean, you know, let's, let's make it applicable. Uh, Luke 2, 4. It says this, so Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth. He went, he had to go, in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem. And he's got, God's got him there now. The town of David because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was, now watch, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. <laughs> Uh, the King James Version doesn't say she was just expecting. The King James amplifies that just a little bit more and says she was great with child. She was ready. And so it says here that, uh, that, that they were pledged. Mary, Luke, what he's doing here is he's pointing out the social stigma that's attached here. I mean, I mean, think about it. We've got a teenage pregnant girl, nine months pregnant. She's not married. She's pledged to be married, but she's not married. That's the social stigma. We've got a, another thing going on. Here's, here's Joseph. <laughs> and, 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 and people have to be thinking, Joseph, you're a big fool, man. You say this baby's not yours, then whose is it? You're crazy. And she's made up this story. Now you're making up a story too. You know, angels come to you guys. There's a, there's a social stigma going on here. And you know people had to be thinking, you know, these are two teenagers that got caught. These are two teenagers, and they got Mary pregnant. That wasn't the case at all. They were still righteous. Even in all of that, they remained righteous. In other words, Joseph had not touched her. She's still a virgin. Because Emmanuel had to be birthed by a virgin. You know, the last thing that any nine-month pregnant woman would want to do is uh, go on an 80-mile walk. Hey, women that have been nine months pregnant, how many of you agree with me? Is that pretty clear, close? Yeah, that's accurate. Uh, and the last thing a man would want to do that has a nine-month pregnant woman is go on a walk with her 80 miles or any, around the house. Uh, yes. uh, 
<laughs> uh, or even in a wagon or riding a donkey. Uh, that would seem like that would speed the thing up a little bit. But, uh, you know, uh, I just, uh, that's the last thing you want to do. I felt so sorry for my wife when she was nine months pregnant. I felt sorry for her just sitting down in a chair, just trying to get down in the chair. And then even worse, when she's trying to get up out of the chair. It's like she rolls out, you know. And, and you, know, you know what I'm talking about. And they had to be concerned about this situation. 80 miles, what if we have this baby on the way? And we have to deliver the baby on a dirt road on the way to Bethlehem. Well, it would have been better than where they ended up, but, but they had to, what, what, if, what if we have to do that? And, you know, I was thinking about that. Mary probably would have liked to have delivered that baby uh, on the road, <laughs> on the way, then carrying her to 80 miles to Bethlehem. But, you know, Mary couldn't change it. And Mary wasn't going to have that baby on the road to Bethlehem. That baby was going to be born in Bethlehem. And I, I believe that baby was born right in the middle of Bethlehem. You know, there's things in our lives that we want to change. <laughs> uh, but I've learned, you know, that, that sometimes I'm going through some tough times and I want to change them. And so I'll look in the middle of, of, the, of the will of God for my life. Am I in, the, in God's will? Am I righteous? Am I causing something? And, and I'm looking and I don't see anything happening, but I'm having these pains, you know, these labor pains. And I just want to deliver right now. I just want this over with. But see, it won't happen until I get to Bethlehem. And many of you are that way. You know, right now, you're going through some stuff, and you want to change it. And you got your heels dug in, and you're trying not to go where God's trying to take you. And let's just do it right here. No, you can't change it. You got to get to Bethlehem. Where is it that God wants you to go? The faster you get there, the faster you can deliver. And those pains stop. But you're going to Bethlehem. You might as well just speed it up and go on down there. Verse 6 says this, while they were there. Okay, they're there. The what came? The what? Time. The fullness of the time. Millennia, millennia, millennia. And now it's time. God has talked about this for millennia. The time has finally come. God is in control of time. The time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn. I ask you a question, okay? A uh, little Bible trivia. How many children does, do we know that Mary at least had? Good wow, come on, folk. We just talked about this a couple of weeks ago. She at least had six, four boys and at least two girls. It just says sisters. They were plural. <laughs> it's more than one. And it lames the four boys. So, but, but, but this is the only one she had in the stable. This is her firstborn. This would be different from all the rest. Now, in a stable, uh, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you think that, that God could do better than a stable for Emmanuel? I mean, wouldn't you think? You know, it doesn't say stable, but it does say manger, and that's where you would find a stable, right? Yeah. And Judy did some word research on that, and the stable actually can mean a ditch. It's a trough. It's, it, it, I mean, a manger, manger can mean a, a, a ditch or a trough. And, and, so, and so this is, can't God, God do better than that? I mean, it just seems like God could give them some kind of decent sanitary place to birth this baby. I mean, cows and animals and lice and fleas. Hello? Dung? Stench? Seems like God could have, could have done better than that. Weren't they in the middle of God's will? Huh? See, just because things aren't going really well for you doesn't mean you're not in the middle of God's will. Or at least you think they're not going good for you. They're exactly the way they're supposed to be because God's in the, in, in the God of time. And, uh, you know, wouldn't you think that that God could uh, have provided them a decent place to stay? I mean, was he not thinking ahead? Did he not know that Bethlehem was going to be full of people? All these people are going to show up, and there's no place for anybody to stay. Was he not thinking ahead? Didn't he know that the Romans were going to be there counting, and the people were going to be showing up? Wasn't God thinking? And rags, couldn't God do something better than cloths to wrap the baby in? Come on. And, you know, I was thinking about it. 
you know, if there wasn't any room for Joseph and Mary in the inn, then there wasn't any room for others in the inn. So how many were in this stable? How humiliating that would be to give birth to your baby in a stable, a nasty, smelly stable, but then around complete strangers that you've never seen before. Let's, let's, let's think about that. Now. See, Emmanuel, the greatest, most important person ever born, was born in the most disgusting, humiliating, and disgraceful environment and circumstances. Jesus was birthed, I think, by a peasant teenage girl who's pregnant and not married, delivered by a teenage boy in a stable that stunk with animals and dung, had mice and rats and lice, fleas. Manuel was wrapped in some cloths. That's all it says. Just rags that you could accumulate real fast. And birthed, I'm sure, in front of complete strangers. What was God doing? One would think, wouldn't you, that God would give the best care, best accommodations. One would give the best clothing, the best nursery equipment, the best of everything to Emmanuel, the most important person who's ever been born. Wouldn't you think that? That's not how it was. You know why? Because had that happened, he wouldn't have been Emmanuel. There's a theological doctrine, and you've all heard of it. It's called the Incarnation. Incarnation. I'm going to throw it out there to you quickly. Most of you are familiar with it. It's in John chapter 1 and verse 2. We, we can read about it a little bit, and I just want to kind of open it up there. And John writes in his gospel as he begins it, his, his first words. He says, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was what? God. How many Christians really consider your Word God? How much time do you spend with God? And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, what we're seeing here is the Trinity, and what John is doing here is he's echoing Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, the very first words in the Bible, the first words of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. John is echoing that, but there's a new creation. When Jesus come, it's a new creation. And he says, in the beginning was the Word. Then in verse 14, he writes this. Of the same chapter, the Word became what? Flesh, human. The Word, God, became flesh and, and made His dwelling among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, seeing the Trinity here, full of grace and truth. And that's Emmanuel. We know about the Trinity of God. It's not Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Our Father, Word, Holy Spirit. Our Father, Emmanuel, Holy Spirit. But it's the center of the Trinity, the, if you will, the heart of the Trinity, the, the centrality of the Trinity, the Word of the Trinity. Put on flesh and dwelt among us. That's Emmanuel. Father and Son and the Holy Spirit is, are the Trinity, but it's the Word, it's the center of it that became, that became flesh. Let me show you this word for incarnation, the dictionary uh, definition of it. Uh, the doctrine that the second or central 
person of the Trinity assumed human form in the person of Jesus Christ and is completely both what? God and man. That's the doctrine of incarnation. Now that's Emmanuel. Now hear hear what I'm about to say because this is really what I want you to get today. See, it's God coming in the most disgusting, humiliating, lowest and disgraceful way to become man. That's what Emmanuel is. Now hear me. It's not a good man. It's not a good man working hard to be good so he can become like God or be God. It's God working so hard that he can become like the lowest man. It's God in the most disgustful of circumstances becoming man, human. True Christianity says that we do not ascend to God through works or any other kind of way. Because what true Christianity is about is about God working so hard to descend to become like us, no matter how low you are, no matter what peasant level you're at, no matter how how society is stigmatizing you, no matter what it is, God says, I can, I can, I can understand. Let's, let's, uh, how many, how many of us have been, was born in a stable? How many of us was wrapped up in some rags when we were born? How many of us were stuck in a manger, feeding trough? None. However, if you were, <laughs> if that was what you were born into, no matter what family or, 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 or gender or, or, or race that you were born into, Jesus was probably low. And he, because he was born lower, can understand anything you or I ever go through. And if he can relate to the lowest, he can definitely relate to you. See, the entire teaching of of incarnation is to show us how God became a person. But we live in the time of Oprah. We live in, in the time of New Age and Scientology. And we're hearing something now along these lines. That if you really want to connect with God, then what you need to do is learn how to channel. You need to learn how to center. Because what God is is a cosmic force. And so you center and you channel into yourself. Because because, because that way you are a part of God. And a part of the cosmic force. And so is that true? And he's God too, and so is that roach bug you just stepped on. <laughs> but that's what we're kind of hearing. You gotta center, you gotta focus, you gotta karma, you gotta channel to connect with God. There's only one way that you or I, any of us, will ever connect with God. And that's through the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5 says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That's it. That's the only way you're going to connect with God. And it's not about channeling. It's not about centering. It's not about becoming a part of the universe so that you can connect with God. It's realizing that God has become man. Emmanuel. It's not about our working to find a way to touch him. It's about his working to find a way to touch you. No matter how low in society you are or go. Emmanuel. That's Emmanuel. Luke 2, 8 says this. And there were shepherds. There were what? Shepherds. Everybody say shepherds. Shepherds, your title of the lesson is Shepherds First, okay? Uh, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. 
It always says that when angels show up. It always, the word here is interesting. It's, it's uh, megas phobio. Mega, big, bunch of it, right? Phobio, fear, frightened. They were mega phobioed. And the, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. The angels always said that. But you're always afraid. He says, I bring you good news. Gospel. Good news of great joy that will be for how many? The lowest? The highest? All the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to whom? To you. Who is you? Who is he talking to here? Who, who, who. I want you to get this. This is, this is vital. Who is he talking to? You've got to see this. A, shepherd's, a Savior has been born to you. Let's, let's put who the you is. To you, shepherds. You with me? I'll show you. That's what he's saying. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. Who? Not to you and me. Uh, we, we wasn't going to find this baby wrapped in, 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 in rags. He's talking to these shepherds. This is a sign to you. A Savior's been born to you. It's a sign for you. You'll get it, is what, is what he's saying. This is a sign for you. You'll understand this. You'll get it. You know, Augustus won't get it. Right. High priest won't get it. <laughs> you know, nobody's going to get it. But, a, but you'll get it. Savior's been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This, is, this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby. Here's the sign. You will find the baby wrapped in rags, cloths, and lying in a feeding trough, manger. You'll get this. You'll understand it. Now, we sing the song, you know, about that night and how the angel, you know, sang, came, showed up to the, to, the, to the shepherds out in the field and all that stuff. And it sounds so sweet and so good. <laughs> but it scared the boojickies out of these people. I mean, it was megas phobia. <laughs> they, they were having a difficult, whoa! I mean, think about it. You know, you're sitting around the campfire roasting some hot dogs, you know, and, and your, your eyes are adjusted to the darkness, and whoom, there's an angel, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Whoa, wait a minute, hold it. But why does he announce this to shepherds? Not just shepherds first, but shepherds only. Millennia, millennia, millennia. And all he tells are these shepherds? Why? Shepherds! <laughs> you know, it was amazing to me as I began to think about that. Uh, you, know, if, if you, you know, there's a lot of people in Bethlehem. A lot of people, right? If you're going to announce it, hey, there's a bunch of people here, just, just go out there and tell somebody. <laughs> you know, just an just, 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 uh, angel show up, everybody's going to come, right? So, so why don't you just go to Bethlehem and just announce it? I mean, it's right there, there everybody can see him right there. Why don't they do that? And if they're going to go out of town, why don't they go to Augustus, the Caesar? That's, that'd be the top way, you know? Why, 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 why not Bill O'Reilly? Why not? <laughs> Beck. He'd like it. Sean Hannity. Oprah, well, you know, bring it, you know, why, why? Go, to, go to Quirinius, go to High Priest, go to, I mean, come on. Go, go, to, go to somebody like that. Here's why. Because Jesus didn't come, Emmanuel didn't come to the rich and the famous. Emmanuel didn't come to the powerful and the popular. And ne neither did he come to the monks and the Pharisees. That monks and Pharisees say, oh, no, no, I can't get into dung. I can't mess with stable people. Pharisees, no, 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 you're, you'll, make, you'll defile me. But Jesus was born in it. Think about it. Jesus spent all of his time with the lowest of society. 
He understood them. He could relate to them. He spent his time with sinners that were in the deepest mess, the stinkingest situations, stable people. He spent his time with prostitutes and demon-possessed. He spent his time with fornicators and the poor. See, Jesus came to the stables and the mangers and the dung of life. That's Emmanuel. He's not a God who stands back and says, you've got to become good if you're going to touch me. He's not a God that stands back and says, you've got a channel, you've got a sinner. No. God became like us so that he could touch us. The angel said it's good news of great joy that will be for all the people. The sign of the, of the shepherds, listen to me, the sign of the shepherds would not be a king in a palace. The sign to the shepherds was a baby in a manger wrapped in rags. Why shepherds? Well, being a shepherd was not the best thing you could be. It was a very undesirable profession. Nobody wanted their occupation to be listed as shepherd. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, really, think about this just for just a second. Uh, they stank. They seldom bathed. Um, they were weird. They ate, slept, <laughs> hung out with animals. Ate with them, slept with them, stayed with them. They couldn't leave them to go to the synagogue for service or to the religious festivals, so they were considered sinners. And a lot of them were, really, thieves and robbers and murderers. I mean, think about Moses, for example. You remember the story about Moses? Moses killed the Egyptian. What did he do? What did he do after he murdered somebody? He ran off into the wilderness and became a shepherd. <laughs> and that's where God found him. <laughs> Moses, you know, think, think about it. Who's a murderer? What about David? David, you know, David shows up to Goliath at the battle there. You know, he's going to knock out Goliath. And what does his brother say to him? Why aren't you home? With those few sheep. You're, you're not important, David. You're nothing. You're at the bottom of the, of the list here. You're at the bottom of the social structure, David. But Jesus says, I am going to be the good shepherd. Now see, Jesus says, I'll smell like you. I'll be with you. I'll wear clothes like you wear. I'll eat what you eat. I'll hang out with you. And when he said that, it was right after John chapter 9. John chapter 9, Jesus heals the man who's born blind. And then the Pharisees arrest him and humiliate him. And right from that, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. What's he saying here is, I, I, can, I can help you. I can be with you. I'll protect you. I'll take care of you. Shepherds. Jesus uh, would smell like them, live, sleep, and eat with them. He'd even, even give his life for them. Shepherds. Jesus would say, go ahead. Put me at the lowest point of society. I'm very comfortable there. In fact, that's where I would rather be than with you upper guys here. God plain, planned and talked about and wrote about the coming of the Messiah for millennia. And he announces it only to shepherds. The biggest event in all of history. And he tells shepherds. Smelly, stinky shepherds. <laughs> Folks, that's Emmanuel. That's Emmanuel. It's with us God was born illegitimately to a peasant girl by a teenage boy who brought him out and birthed him and cut the cord or whatever. With us is God, 
born in the tiny insignificant town of Bethlehem. With him, with, with us is God, born in the lowest sort, and probably a stable and smelly animals. With us is God, wrapped in rags, and placed in a feeding trough. With us is God, announced to, recognized by, and worshipped first by shepherds. See, if God can reach the lowest, he can reach the highest. There's nothing and no point in life, the Bible says he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. There's no place you can go in life that Jesus can't understand. Now that's good news. That's what the angel said, right? I'm bringing you some good news. I don't care who you are or what level of life you're at. God understands because of Emmanuel. Luke chapter 2 verse 13 says, Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was laying in the manger. Now, the, the angel didn't say, I want you to go. He said, it's a sign to you. You'll, if you want to go look, you can find him right here. But it wasn't a command that you got to go. But it says they hurried off to go see. They didn't put it off. It, it's fascinating to me today how many people put off finding Jesus. I talk to people all the time. I talked to someone this week. And, and his solution was going to be finding Jesus. But he wanted to sit around his campfire. He wanted to roast his hot dogs when he could have eaten a, a steak. They wanted to put it off. Why put it off? I don't get it. I just don't. That fascinates me. Here's the solution to your whole life. It's right here. Oh, I'm going to wait. I, I might do that one day. Oh, okay. <laughs> How many of you put it off? Do you know people that put it off? Verse 17 says this. When they had seen him, they spread the word. They did what? Spread the word concerning what had been told them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. They found him and then they couldn't stop talking. Everybody they met, they were telling him all about what they had heard from God and about this baby, about this child, about Emmanuel. You know, it's about the end of the year. There's only a few more days left in our year. How many people have you told all year long about what you've heard and about this child, Emmanuel? Anyone? See, statistics are that you haven't. Most of us sitting in this room have told nobody all year long. I don't get it. When you've really seen him, when you've really been close to him and you've really worshipped him, you can't stop telling people about it. How many people have you told? Luke 2.19. 2, 2, but Mary treasured up all these things and did what? Pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. Mary pondered. Let me show you this, this Greek word here. It's symbolo. And what it means is to combine. What she did is combine everything. Combine what happened there and what happened. Combine the trip down to, to Bethlehem. Combine the, this thing that's going on here now in this stable. Combine these rags. Combine these shepherds coming. Combining all this together. And she's pondering it. I think that's what God would have each of us do this year. Is sometime find a place to get alone. And ponder what God's doing in your life. All around you. All the time. The good times and the bad times. Times when you're nine months pregnant trying to make it to Bethlehem. But then the times when you're sitting there and you're amazed at this wonderful baby. The good times when God has blessed your socks off. But the bad times when you have to go through surgery. Ponder it all in your heart. 
You see, if you will, you're going to have a good life. If you will, you're going to come out with some good answers. And God's going to bless you. Let's pray. Father, Emmanuel. Not us working hard so we can become like God, but God working so hard so he can become like each of us, like me, like each person here, so he can touch us. He smells like us. He wears clothes like us. He eats with us. He, he's come to us. With us, God. Father, I pray for each person here. Here's just what I felt today as I was preparing with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I just, I just felt just to challenge you with this. We will sometime, maybe between now and the end of the year or between now and Christmas Day, the 25th, would you, would you find some time maybe just to get alone and ponder? Ponder in your heart what God's done for you. The blessings that he's put upon your life, your children, your spouse, your job, your whatever. The good times and the bad times. See how God's worked through every single one of them. See how he's working in your time because God is good all the time and all the time God is good. If that's you and you just kind of accept that and you're going to try to find a moment, a time. Now, I'm not saying Christmas Day because I don't think that's a good day to do it, but, but a time where you can just get alone. Now, I'm not talking about joining hands with your family and praying. That's good too. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is Mary was alone and she pondered this in her own heart. Would you maybe do that? Just find a time. If that's you and you'll say, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to get alone out in the yard or bedroom or driving to work or whatever but I'm just going to ponder all God's done for me if that's you would you raise your hand right where you're sitting and just let me pray for us father I do I pray for all these people raising all these hands so father I ask you lord that you will you'll cause us to come to a place these next few days where we ponder all you've done for us we'll tell somebody about the baby we'll we'll go we'll, we'll go hurriedly to find him and we'll and, we'll, and we'll, we'll tell people about what you've told us and about this baby. Father, I pray each one of us gets to do that. Head still bowed and eyes closed. Now, I don't know everybody, I, but I know many. And I know that some of you aren't where you need to be with God. You slip back. You're not where you need to be. You may have made a, a prayer a long time ago, but for some reason you've, you've kind of slipped away from God. And you just know you're not where you need to be. Listen, this is the time of the year, and there's not a better time than to say, I need Jesus to come to me. That's Emmanuel. It's not that you've got to get better. It's that you've just got to let him come. He wants to come to your life and change you. If that's you, you just know you're not where you need to be with God, whether you've ever prayed a sinner's prayer or not, or whether you've ever received or ever walked with God or not. It's irrelevant. Where are you right now, right this minute? You know you're not where you're supposed to be, where you need to be. God wants to birth something in you and through you. And the sooner you get to Bethlehem, the sooner your life's going to be better. So if that's you and you're just not where you need to be with God, you'd say, preacher, just pray for me. You're just right where you're sitting, right where you're sitting. Would you just lift your hand up right where you're sitting and say, pray for me, preacher. I see your hands, hands all 